I had a sermon today I'm going I'm to give you. It's actually going to be a sermon series that I'm going to start. I know Jeff hates that because it messes up his mailer that he's got to mail out the DVDs to. But I, I got a feeling this will be two or three parts easy. In fact, there's so much information, I almost didn't even know where to start on it. Is There's information that God's been revealing now that's coming to light that a lot of people are seeing. One of the things I've thought about for years and I couldn't understand that how do we as a nation go from a nation of peace and blessings, a nation we're basically filled with love and admiration with one another, to what we see the Bible tells us is going to be before Jesus Christ returns. We have many examples of how a nation would come from a nation of love to a nation of, of hate. How do, we, how do we get to that stage where a person will literally kill a brother thinking they do God a service. So how do we get to that stage? I thought a lot about that. So I'm going to talk about some of that today. I want to lay the foundation for what I believe is very, very important. It's going to build on the spiritual principles of a foundation of the timeline that we've laid out now for seven years. Now I want to put in some of the pieces of a puzzle. I actually won't get very much into the timeline today except to talk about the spiritual nature of what's going to change in our nation itself. Because you see, Satan is the master of misdirection. One of the things that's really interesting that you notice that when you have someone who is opposing you or someone who considers you an enemy, they begin accusing you of what they are doing. You ever notice that? None more relevant than in politics today. It's the misdirection. The other thing is that Satan... In his wisdom, because he's pretty wise, that God gave him, corrupt but wise, is he will take something that God says to do, he will bring it to the surface, he will corrupt it and tell you don't do that. One of the things that I've noticed over the years when we got into this timeline series was that about the stars. With the church, for I've been in the church since 1971, is that you don't look at stars, you don't talk about stars, that's all pagan. But actually, in the very book of Genesis, to begin with, God says he put them out there for that very reason, so he would be able to use those things to instruct us. So those are the things that we're looking at. So recently, there's another thing that came out. In the rush now to turn our world upside down, we had phrases that seem spiritual, that are reversed to what God says. For example, the Green New Deal. We've got 12 years before we destroy the planet. The end of the world is coming in 12 years. Well, the Bible doesn't say that, so where is that coming from? But it's almost spiritual in nature. Then the election comes upon us, and many of the candidates are saying it was a fight for the soul of America. You notice how these things have spiritual implications. Well, here's another one. It's going to be a dark winter. Have you heard that one? That's where I want to start with today. We're going to have a dark winter. Of course, this was in the election, and now it's being continued into going into the past election now, of where we're going through. And it was done because of the other party who was in control. You keep him in control, it's going to be an ugly, dark time. But notice how, impl how this is implied from Scripture that is exactly where they're going to take us. In Matthew 4, 16 says, The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them that sat in the region of the shadow of death, light is sprung up. As we know, the, the Bible gives us implicitly the duality of events in time. So when Jesus Christ came the first time, He found the world in darkness. When he comes back the second time, that is the condition the world will be in again. So you can see how the enemy uses the spiritual principle of what God intends to bring upon mankind to reverse it so that you don't do what God wants you to do. So today I'm going to begin the series. And in this series is called Pre-war normalization of America. Pre-war normalization 
of America. How do I go from a state of a nation as we are today that it becomes normal to hate someone? From light to dark. So God has given us examples that I'm going to show you today of how we go through this to reach that stage. Because it's quite interesting when you look in Washington, D.C. today, we have four to five times as many troops in our capital as we have in Afghanistan and Iraq put together. Unbelievable when you look at that, that capital city, how surrounded it is. And it is quite interesting before the election how no one of these governors and mayors around the city said, you're not putting these troops in our city. But now it's accepted. Isn't it interesting how they want to praise the police officers now, increase their pay, and thank them for protecting us while we've had six months of nothing but hatred? Dehumanization, you might say. Defund the police. They're our enemy. And now it's all turned around again. What is going on around the nation? Amos 3 says, Surely the Lord does nothing lest he reveal his secret to his servants, the prophets. That's you and I. That's all of God's people in the churches of God, as I call them, the church of God community that's been broken up. And pretty much most all of them got their roots to the worldwide church of God, either directly or indirectly. Has God scattered them according to Daniel? He said he would. Isaiah 46.10 says, Declaring the end from the beginning and the ancient of times to things not yet done. So now we can look at what we understand that we don't have to worry about what God's going to do. You don't have to worry about prophecies you don't understand yet. You don't have to worry about the conspiracies and all the theories and the things that are taking place. Because God says He's not going to do it till He tells you first. But amazingly... According to Amos 46.10, he's already told us. Now there's the conundrum. What we don't know is like the position that Daniel was in when God revealed it out there, it had to wait for the interpretation for God to give us the understanding. I believe we have just crossed into one of those times within the past two weeks. And I want to share that with you today. Matthew 4, 16, what we just said, the people who sat in darkness saw great light in that region. Ephesians 6, 12 says this, But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Quite often we quote that phrase, don't we? But it's the recognizing the spiritual intent of what God has not being deceived by what the demons have or what they're saying. Because you're seeing this battle go on all the time now. In fact, it reaches the point where it tells us in the Old Testament that even the elect's going to have a hard time discerning between right and wrong. Have you found yourself in that position yet? Have you received a phone call? I'm telling you, my computer last weekend, Saturday and Sunday, it never stopped. I got phone calls, I got emails, I got stuff coming over there, texting into it. I couldn't hardly put together a news and nuggets because there was so much information being spread around about what's taking place. And pretty much none of it's happened. Pretty much. Genesis 1-2 says this, The earth was or became without form and was void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. There we are again. The darkness. The truth is, is that that is Satan's intention to be able to bring darkness upon this world. That's the way it was from the beginning. Look at Ezekiel 28, verse 12. This is talking about Satan or Lucifer at that time. He says, You're, you sealed up the sum full of wisdom, and you were perfect in beauty. You had been in the Garden of Eden, and every precious stone was your covering. The tab rays of your pipes were prepared in you from the day that you were created. Jump into verse 14, it says, You are the anointed cherub that covered. Now, when we look at Genesis 1, 1, then 1, 2, we see that at that time is total darkness. When we see Satan in the garden, he's a serpent. We don't see him this way. This is talking about a precondition of the world that Satan was on this planet and brought it to darkness. 
That is his goal again, to bring this planet back to darkness. Thus we see in Matthew, when Jesus Christ came the first time, it was heading to darkness. The people who sat in darkness saw a great light. So when Jesus comes back, it will be the final step before Satan has his way again to bring this world back to darkness. There's only one thing stopping him from him accomplishing his goal to defeat Jesus Christ at that last time. You realize what that is? It's you. It says, if not for the elect's sake, no flesh would be saved. You realize how important your job is? Everything you see today, all of the rumors, all of the nonsense that are out there, the false prophecies, everything that's taken place are smoke screens. It eventually is all going to come to this. God says Satan will turn his attention to the remnant. He's going to go after you. That's where all of this is going to. Now, that is hard to fathom. Out of 7 billion people on the face of the earth, he's got a remnant of people who have his truth, who keep his commandments, who have the testimony, which is the spirit of prophecy. And how many churches today don't want to talk about prophecy? I know when I traveled for many years, the people said, oh, he's coming in, he's going to talk about prophecy, he's going to talk about end time events. We're tired of hearing that. We've been listening to that for 50, 60 years. Well, that's what ancient Israel said. That's what Judah said. That's what they talked about for almost 100 years. God said, repent. And it finally came upon them. Well, you're here now, and that time is upon us that God is beginning to move again, and things are going closer to the end time. Because when they said we have but 12 years to the end of the world, they were right about one thing. It may be 12 years to the end of Satan's rule on this planet. When you look at the prophecies, they bring us to the time period that you are in right now. And don't let anybody tell you any differently. This is the timeline that I'm going to get into at the very end today, and I'm going to begin filling in pieces of a puzzle. We're not talking about laying out new times. Now what we want to work on in the time frames we are in today is the spirit of the time of the timeline. See, I believe we've gotten all the information we need to know. What God is revealing for us today is how do you live within that period of time? It was interesting, I've got an email from from uh, one of our, our uh, supporters and one of our viewers. And she wrote me last week and she said, I'd really like to hear about living in these times. She said, you said that in the past, you said that we all know how to live. You know, we need to, and I, and I thought about it. I said, well, you know, she's right. Because you see, living in these times is different than living back in the 50s or the 60s. So we're living in times that are totally different. And how we live in these times and how we react and how we deal with what's laid upon us will make a difference between salvation and loss of life. So what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to take this here and show this as a timeline of where we, we're going to begin to fill pieces in to show you the duality of time of where we live today and where it was back in pre-war Germany. If you were Daniel and God gave you this, with the information that you know, what would you share with this timeline to others to make things plain as to what God's doing? That's what, I want to, that's what I want to get into in this series. Because you see, we need to be able to share where you are today to make sense of it, removing all of the smokescreen and get into the Word of God to be able to do this. So this is God's timeline. So the previous timelines that laid out God's prophesied, uh, events that God prophesied would come to pass. From those timelines, God gives us the insight of the spiritual warfare we'll face when the duality of events come to pass. All right, so that's what we had before. So now we're going to see how we deal with them today. The period of time before 1939, from 1925, and as far as 1924, by the way, this period of time was, was pre-war normalization before the war. If we went to Europe and we studied the history of all of this time, what would we find? 
The point is what we find in the physical pre-war normalization is the same battle that you and I are going to find before Jesus Christ returns with the spiritual war that's coming upon all mankind. And you will find the reality of what's taking place then is what's beginning to take place right now. This timeline will focus on the time where prophecy becomes current events. So when we look at the Bible and we see all of the prophets of the old, when you look at them and you begin to realize what that guy just prophesied is what we just saw. That ought to wake everybody up. They become current events. What prophecy becomes day-to-day -day news. I don't know if you realize it or not, but that's where you are today. Prophecy is becoming day-to-day -day news. Pre-war normalization. Bringing a nation of peace and blessings to the state of catastrophic gradualism. I, I saw the phrase in the head. I said, it caught my attention. I said, wow, what is that? I went and read the article of showing how, the, how you, take, you take a nation to gradually change till it becomes so catastrophic you can't fix it. That's what happened in pre-war Germany and many other nations in Italy, Japan, and that is what's happening to America right now. It means that everything it does only adds to the continual state of decay of the nation. You ever notice they try to fix something and it gets it worse? It does. I mean, that's what's going on right now. God says he's removed the wisdom of the wise. It is the condition that ancient Judah found itself in when God sent Jeremiah to warn them. Everything they did only added to the decay and the destruction. There were two stages of his warnings. First were the warnings of the repentance. Thankfully, we're still in that stage. But it might be too late in some areas already. Second, God sent Jeremiah to tell him, it's too late. It's too late. He went and says, listen, quit fighting. It is only going to bring about your death. Is you're going to go into captivity and just get yourself ready for it because you're going to go there for 70 years. What if we're there today? Not that we'd be there for 70 years because God said he's going to make a short work. We're not talking timeline here, remember? We're talking the spiritual intent of what's going on. What if God's just told us that? What if God says, you didn't repent? You had time. You had four years. You refused to bring me the glory, and you didn't repent. You continued to live your life. Abortions got worse. Sin got worse. Crime got worse. You didn't repent. What if it's too late? What if God today is telling us, get ready to go to captivity? I could sugarcoat this for you, but I don't think I'd give you justice if I did something like that. By the way, I didn't answer that just now, did I? I'm going to see if we can let God's Word answer that as we go through this series. As these end-time events begin to unfold... They will be accompanied by rumors, conspiracies, false prophecies. It says there shall be false, all rise false Christ and false prophets, and there shall great signs and wonders, and so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And brethren, I get, I'm getting information from brothers and sisters out there who are buying nonsense. Absolute nonsense. I said, what are they thinking? Where's their faith in the scriptures? You need to be founded in God's holy word. God promises you these, these protections going forward. Pre-war normalization, it begins by removing freedoms. What have we seen this past year? We have voluntarily, for our own good, they tell us, give up many of our freedoms. We watch the nation be destroyed through those freedoms as businesses go out of business. As those who challenge those restrictions go to jail while we let prisoners out makes no sense. This whole thing is nutty. Supposedly, these protections are for us by replacing freedom with fear and control. Even in a Church of God community, where we took the stance early, we trust God, 
If a person needs to wear a mask, wear a mask. We don't know the condition of the individual, their age, their health. They might need, to need it more of protection and concern, but nobody judged one another. Well, we saw other Church of God communities, they split because they say, no, you have to wear a mask. And they say, no, we're not going to wear a mask. We're brothers who've been together for decades, separate with one another. So this makes no sense. But that's what it is. Divide and conquer. Fear and control. Today, what is going on in the Capitol? All right. Today in Washington, D.C. Now, when I put this together just a couple days ago, there were 20,000 troops going there. Now they tell me there's 25,000 going there. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not getting a lot of that information being chattered over my, those, the nets and the waves and people and email and the uh, continuous stuff I get. I don't see it all. Now, I'm not saying that it's not out there that they're saying, but I don't see what they're seeing is going on. So I says, this is a quote from the Metro Police Chief. I think you can expect to see somewhere of upwards of beyond 20,000 members of the National Guard that will be here in the footprint of the District of Columbia. 20,000 people in the Capitol? Plus all the way around the country. Every Capitol building around the country is going to be going through this. The National Guard inauguration deployment four times more, this is from Newsweek, more than the number of troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, can, can there really be that much chatter going on here in America that you need 20,000 people? They didn't send that many people to, the, to Iraq and Iran to begin with when they began to fight this stuff. It was a gradual buildup. What if it's a smokescreen? What if that is a smokescreen? I don't know that it is or it isn't. I don't know there's enough information that you would threaten what's going on here because of what took place just a week ago. So what if you wanted to create a state of fear and anxiety? This would be a way to do it. What if you wanted to separate and control your opponent? This would be a way to do it. What if you wanted to silence your voice of your opponent? This would be a way to do it. What would that look like when you finally got it all said and done? It would kind of look like this, wouldn't it? Isn't that interesting? That's a shot in Washington, D.C. this week. Amazing. Can we have that much infiltration terrorists going on right now? I don't know. I don't think so, but there might be. So the question, who do you believe, is a better question. Who can you believe? Well, you and I have the scriptures. We ought to lean on that first. Can you believe the government? Well, if you do, do you believe the left? The right? How about the deep state? How about the independent conspiracies? Are they going to take over the government? There's a lot of that going on out there. How about the news media? Can you believe the news media? Everybody's laughing now. If anybody at home is, everybody's shaking the news. No way you believe the news media. But would that be the conservative or the liberal news media? You see what I'm talking about? There's so much out there. What do you believe? Here's some headlines. Prosecutors say strong evidence shows the Capitol rioters wanted to capture and assassinate the officials. Here's another one. Feds warn of violent extremism likely to surge in 2021 as Capitol state houses are fortified against right-wing groups. By the way, they've got a left-wing guy out there now. You saw that, huh? The left-wing guy has been running around the country saying, burn this place down. He was in the White House, and he was in the Capitol building. They got him in the Capitol building in garments, wearing, rallying everybody up to burn this place down. He's a left-wing extremist. How did he sneak in with Trump supporters? By the way, how many sneaked in with the Trump supporters? Well, how about this one? Democrats in Congress are worried their colleagues might kill them. Really? House members are openly accused four right representatives of threatening their health and safety after the Capitol riot. Can you, all this stuff, well, how about this one? Yesterday, AOC Ohan Omar said the squad made accusations that they were afraid of their lives 
because the white ring supremacists were going to kill them for being women of color. This stuff you can't make up. Now, I said last summer that you would find there's coming a time where the white male would be the most hated person on the face of the earth. All of a sudden, this has moved into racism again in a way you've never seen before. Why would I say that? Because the Bible predicted it, believe it or not. Because here's where it comes from. It's not white and black. It's between believer and non-believer. When God chose Abraham, then Isaac, and then Jacob, and you had the 12 tribes of Israel, they were the tribes who came out of the, the Scandinavian countries in England and Scotland and Australia, primarily of, of a white race. So when God saved, brought them through to America, what Satan is, he's going after them no different than he went after the Jews because the connection point isn't race, it's salvation. In all of those of color, if you think you got it saved, you better think again because it's not race because you carry the same spirit that I carry, the spirit of God the Father, which Satan wants to destroy. What they will come after is the spirit in you, not the spirit of your color. But you will find it will be brought into a race like you've never seen before. And we need to understand that. We have one people, whether born an Israelite or grafted in, it makes no difference today. We are all the same. That is what Satan is going after. Those who have the spirit of God in them. And if you let yourself be pulled away from the news media who begin to say all this stuff, you will be pulled away from your protection of God. Doesn't matter what the color is. Let them have the problem, not you. So now, the internet. Can we believe the internet? Remember there used to be a commercial on TV come through? Well, if it's on the internet, you've got to believe it. Remember that one? All the conspiracies that are taking place. I recommend if you haven't seen this sermon, go online. I don't know if we have it to mail out anymore, but this was back in June. It's called The Coming Age of Conspiracies. When I gave that sermon, I didn't think it would be this quick. But man, things are moving so fast. If you've got it, go back and listen to it again. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of information in that sermon. This is just a couple slides from it. Matthew 24 says, Wherefore, if they say to you, Behold, he's in the desert, don't go there. If he's in secret chambers, believe it not. So, wherefore they, if they say, who is they? See, that's interesting because, you see, that's plural. In other words, there's a conspiracy going on when you see that. There's an actual conspiracy, I mean, coming together for an unlawful act, joined together to conspire. That's when the government loves conspiracy, because if you get together with two people and you talk about it, you might be conspiring, even if you're not. The Bible warns at the end of days there would come a confederacy of spirits. In other words, the conspiracy of spirits that will be out there to deceive mankind against God to deceive the very elect. So there are false prophets, false Christs, and they show so great signs and so much that it was possible they shall deceive the very elect. Realize how serious this is? going on. 2 Thessalonians 2 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gathering together unto him, that you soon not be shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us. I got tricked last week. I thought there was somebody was asking me for money from the church. I knew the person, but I didn't know, like they asked me some crazy, I mean, it was a crazy request. I said, what in the world? Come to find out, I'm trying to help the person, but what they wanted to me to do made no sense. You know, I just, I'll just send you a couple hundred dollars if that's what you need. But what they wanted me to do made no sense. They wouldn't just take the money. Come to find out, Audrey went and looked into it. It's a conspiracy online on how to get money out of you by using a card. But your emails are being infiltrated and sent to other brothers and you try to do the right thing to help them. And then for three days, I went back and forth with this person. I said, I'm not doing what you're asking me to do. It makes no sense. Come to find out it wasn't even a person. I even had a check made in the mail to go to them. And they said, no, no, don't mail it to them and do this. 
I went out and got there just before the mailman did. Can you see that person getting this check and say, why are you mailing this check to me? And it wasn't even them doing it. I said, wow. I got tricked on that one, trying to help a brother. So, I mean, you got to prove all things. The conspiracy, by letter, by means, the cons- correspond by distance. But today is text, Facebook, Internet, almost unlimited means to spread information. God says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that they shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed in the son of perdition. So at the end time, there's going to be people in the church who have the truth are going to let it go. They're just going to let it go. End time conspiracies will appear to be physical in nature, but they're not. They are driven by Satan's evil spirits and his demons. Always remember that. What you're seeing on the surface is driven by an evil spirit that you don't see. Always back up. When you see something, there's something going to rile you up, back up and go to prayer. Always take that, your first action, go to prayer and ask God to guide you. And he will. How about this? Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I read that one earlier. That is a byword of what we go through today, the conspiracies. Isaiah 8, verse 12, say, not a confederacy. This is interesting how the, the King James Version uses this. Say, not a confederacy to all those of these people. Say a confederacy, fear not, nor be afraid. That comes from Strong's, the Strong 7195 Kishar, which, which means this. This is the NIV version. There's verse 11. Let me read verse 12 now. It says, do not call a conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. Every time we turn around, there's these conspiracies that are out there and what's going on. Weigh it against the Scripture. If you can't find in Scripture the before and the after, if you can't find the event built and spelt out from Scripture that makes understanding of where we're going through today, ignore it. If it's right and if it's important, God will reveal it. But if it makes no sense and you can't find where it fits, when people give me information, because I'm always being confronted with people with a new idea, in my mind what I let it do, I let it run the scriptures in my mind. Quite often you find me not saying a word. Because what I'm trying to do is find what I was just told somewhere in the scripture that matches up. I don't always find it. I don't have all the scriptures in my head. Believe me, I don't. But somehow, if you do that, God's Spirit will guide you. And things will come up and you say, I don't see that anywhere in the Scripture. When I don't see it anywhere in the Scripture, not that it's not there, that I don't see yet, it goes on the shelf. I don't act on it. And especially don't preach it. That's what you need to do. That is protection. So people know, how do I live in this day and age? Well, that's one of the things right there. When you see something and you hear something, let your mind, let the Holy Spirit take you through the Scriptures. That means your mind's got to stay in the Scriptures. That means you have to be in prayer, in meditation, and let it. It's, it's almost like your computer. When you, you type in a word, the older, it's, they're real fast today, but in the older ways, you would see it like it's thinking. It's trying to find it. And then it finds something to pull it up where it's at. That's what your mind has to do. You have to stay alert. You have to be aware of what God says versus what they're telling you. So quite often somebody will tell me something and say, well, that makes no sense according to Scripture. That doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the plan of God. If it doesn't fit the plan of God, that goes back on the board. Then I get rid of it. I don't, I don't say any, use it anymore until something else shows up that may support it. So the Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy, it says. He is the one you are to fear. Now, you don't have to fear all the stuff that's going on out there, all those conspiracies and all that's taking place. Forget about them. God says, fear him only. Fear him only. Do not call a conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. So now, who do you believe? You got all these things that are out there. Who in the world can you believe? Can you believe the church? No. Not without proving it out. Prove all things. Everything I'm telling you, go to your Bible and prove it out. Prove it out. Now, what we've got in that timeline, when I put all that out, I'll be very careful because I don't prophesy. In fact, you'll not find one prophecy in that timeline. Seven years. 
because I don't have prophesying power. What we have is discerning power of events that God's revealing to us. Because what God says he will do, he will do. He will move time. He says prophecies will fail. He says you're to cut time short. So how can you prophesy if God hasn't given that to you yet? All right, so now who do you believe? Even in the various church of God, there's widespread differences of beliefs. So what can you believe? Different churches of the church of God community have different, different beliefs. Since the scattering of the power of the holy people, Daniel 12, 7, many churches have been in numerous, have been numerous doctrines and numerous false prophecies that creep into the church in some communities, some church of God communities. And I've seen that before, and I've gone to visit different groups, and I have a doctrine. It's like, where did you get that? <laughs> oh, well, we just found it online and brought it in without proving it out. I say, wow. And then you sit down and you say, well, listen, let me, let me, let me, let's talk about that. In this sermon, pre-war normalization, I want to cover just one that pertains to this message. This is pertaining to a false prophecy of a church. It's something I don't normally do, but I thought this was important, and this is the only day that I have opportunity to do that because of the election coming Wednesday. As I read this piece that came out from one of the churches, I'll show you in just a second, I found myself in the position very similar that, that Jeremiah found himself in with one of the prophets of his day. They were at odds with one another. One prophet said one thing, and Jeremiah said something else. This church said one thing, and I'm saying something else. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about today. Then I will go through and show you why I believe what I'm saying. The Philadelphia Church of God, which many people know, I don't get this magazine, I've been cut off from that, is that at the beginning of January, it's called Rule of Law, Why the President Will Prevail. Now, that is a hope that many of the Church of God community believe. That is, I would hope, personally. I mean, when I look at the two sides of what's going on, I'm certainly going to pick the Trump side versus the left because you're beginning to see what's going on with the left already. But is that what God says? It's not about what you feel or what you would like. It's about the reality of what God says. Why Donald Trump will remain as America's president. Now, you could say, well, that was before a lot of information in the last two weeks. But there was an article that came out on January 12th which supported their magazine's position. And part of what it says is, by all appearances, the radical left in America is on the cusp of a complete victory. Uh, there, is no, there is a legitimate fear that with its grip on the presidency, the House and the Senate will have unchecked power and transform America into an utterly different country. And what they're saying is, so because of this, that can't happen. Because there's not enough prophecies that's been fulfilled yet. So we have to have four more years with President Trump so that God can do his job. Really, is that what God says? So now, I don't agree with that. I agree with you. Sure, I'd like to have seen him back in power for four years. That's what my prayer was. You know? But let's go on. So where do we go with this? I believe that's a false prophecy. All right? Now, we will know in four days. <laughs> Wisdom would say, why would I jump into this boat? My wife's sitting there saying, well, right, why are you doing this? Because I need to show you something. I need to show you from Scripture why I believe that this is misguiding God's people. All those people who were in Washington, D.C., when they were taking the vote, they had the belief that they would make a difference. They had the belief that Vice President Pence had the power to not accept the votes and make the change, and Donald Trump was going to stay in office. It was a false hope and a lie. It could not happen. It's not according to any law or any statute, or any judgment of the United States. Couldn't happen. 
Now, you can disagree. That's fine. It would show if it could happen, it would have happened. But it didn't. Even if it could have happened, God didn't let it happen. Right? Now, let me say this. Did the people pray? Did they not have revivals? Did they not have prayers and fasting? Did they have all of that going on out there that God would put him in office again? It didn't work. Did God not have the power to prevent a theft from taking place? Because I believe there was a theft taking place too. You'll never convince me any otherwise. And people on the left will say the whole thing's a lie. That's, that's a bunch of bunk. Fine. I don't believe a bit of it. One word of it because I believe it was stolen. Did God not have the power to stop it? Yes. Did he not have the power to overturn it? Yes. It didn't happen. When, when Hananiah gave his prophecy, which I'm going to show you in just a second, it contradicted what God had just told Jeremiah. I'm going to show you what that prophecy here contradicts what God shows us according to his word. Why am I doing this? Because I want you to put your nose in the Bible and not listen to false prophecies. So now, let's go into it. There are two scripture books for guidelines. First, one of the most important understandings is the duality coming out of captivity and going into the captivity in the promised land. You see that in 1 Corinthians 10. Very detailed why God did that, 1 Corinthians 10. It says those events were recorded for our salvation. So we don't make the same mistakes. All right, and two, Jeremiah. Jeremiah was recorded for us to give us the understanding of the day-to-day before going into captivity. All right, those are the two books. I'm going to give you examples of, from each one of where I stand on this. So let's take number two first. Different prophecies, same event. Jeremiah versus Hananiah the prophet. By the way, Hananiah was a legitimate prophet. He was those in authority at the time, the, just like the trumpet, just like the Philadelphia Church of God. They were a carryover from the worldwide Church of God. They're a legitimate Church of God. They actually believe they're the one and the only church that's legitimate. And they got they a lot of strange things up there. I'm not there to, to just run the people down. I'm hoping that if anybody gets this sermon, you got a friend who's in that church, you share this sermon with them. They might not like me to begin with. <laughs> You know, we say in News Nuggets and Insights, share it with your friends. They're going to love you for it or not. This time is going to be the or not to begin with until they prove it out. Jeremiah is recorded for us for today. So let's take a look at the example. I'm just going to give you a piece of it. You can go into, it's online, Hananiah. It's, you know, it's called one of the lesser books, lesser known characters of the Bible is Hananiah. He comes from a lineage of, of prophets. He was the person who was in charge. He was the king's aide. He was the big guy, big dude. Right up there, Jeremiah was hated, the little guy. Kind of like the story that we're talking about today. People don't know who we really are. We're a small church. People know the Philadelphia church. They're big. Tens of millions of dollars coming in. All right, going on. Jeremiah 28. So it came to pass in the year beginning at the reign of Zedekiah, the king of Judah, in the fourth year and in the fifth month, that Hananiah sent a son of Azar, the prophet, which was of Gibeon, says, Speak unto me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests, and all the people, saying, Speak, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two full years I will bring you again into this place and all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar and the king of Babylon took away from this place and carry them to Babylon. And I will again bring this place... Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, says the Lord, and I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. So what are you saying? He says, God just told me in two years, we're bringing everything back from Babylon, all the riches that came out of the temple, we're bringing back the kings, and we're all going home, we're going to be safe. Great prophecy. Philadelphia just told you, that Trump's going to be in office for four more years. What he just said. It's in black and white. We'll know in four days. Hanani and a prophet said that. Most of Judah had already been taken captive, the king of Babylon, the king of Nebuchadnezzar. 
when Hanani prophesied that within two years they would be restored and back in Judah. The problem? Jeremiah had just told them they were going to be captives for 70 years. Just told them that. I'm telling you, I don't think it's going to happen. In fact, I don't believe at all it's going to happen this Wednesday. Yes, there's miracles. But see, God doesn't break law to bring about miracles. So he'd have to break his own laws to do that. There's nothing in, there's nothing there that can let this happen. You can say there could be a revolt. They can take over the White House. But when it's all said and done, it's illegal. A nation that God established. And when it was all said and done, they will have to leave and the legitimate person there would have to go in. So nothing works. I mean, there's no, there's no scenario out there that works. As much as people, as much as I've tried, I have tried for two months to make this work. And about a month or so ago, I said, look, it's impossible. It can't work. It won't work. So now, what's going on? Why would that make a difference? All right? That's the first time. Now, to explain the difference, I need to go into the Bible to tell you why I don't believe it's going to happen. So now, one, 1 Corinthians tells us about the events that happened in the Old Testament, all right? Moreover, brethren, I wouldn't have you be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, all baptized to Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They were all examples to us that we should not do and lust after the things they lusted after. Verse 11, all these things happened to them for examples that we should be written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. When he wrote this last part right here, that's because they thought the ends of the world were coming in their day. So what, what he was referring to, all the information that was recorded there that they were looking at, they thought everything was there for them then, not for us now. But you see, that's for us now. So we don't do the same thing that they did. 1 Corinthians 10 is the key for understanding the end time events. So now, let's go on. So I want to focus on two specific lessons now of Israel's plight from Egypt that gives us the insight, believe it or not, into the re-election. You would never guess that that could even be there to think about. You need to understand the principal intent of what's taking place. So now, I find it in Numbers 14. Remember the spies in the promised land? So I won't go through the whole story. Remember, they went in, spied the land for 40 days. They came back out and said, yeah, everything you told us is true. However, they got some giants in there. They got well-armed cities and walls. And I mean, this is more than we can handle. And they said, we're not going in. Remember the story? So everybody wept and they cried. So God says, but as truly as I live, and all the earth shall be filled with the glory of God, but because of those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times that have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swore to their fathers, and neither shall any of them provoke me see it. So what has that got to do with us? Let me show you what they did when they didn't accept what God had just showed them. I asked you a question a little while ago. Does God have the power to put Trump back in office? Sure, he could have. Four years ago that happened, didn't it? Nobody believed it. It was a miracle. He got in office. Couldn't God have done that again? Yeah, he, but it didn't happen, did it? So each time in each state, in each case, they went time after time, 30, 40, 50 times. Finally, they went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, I'm not going to listen to it. And I'm going to tell you something. Had the Supreme Court listened to them, that it had no choice but to overthrow it because they had the proof that nobody would listen to. Did God not have the power to open up those nine people's eyes to see it? Were not at least three of them just put in by Trump? Conservatives? Didn't happen, did it? No, it didn't happen. So what am I telling you? Let's go see some example in the, in the Bible. So Moses told all these things to the children of Israel and the people mourned greatly. So they rose up early in the morning and they got to the top of the mountain and said, Lo, we are here. We will go to the place where God has promised, for we have sinned. All right? Like Jeremiah, there was two cases. One is repent, and the next is it's too late. 
God's about to tell him it's too late. And Moses said, Wherefore, do not trespass against the commandment of the Lord. It shall not prosper you. When they showed up in Washington, D.C. on that day, they just turned everything over to the enemy. God had already showed us he was not in this election for Trump. Whether people like it or not, that is the bottom line. And you don't have to like me for it, I understand. But look what else happened to them there that's happening to America today. It goes on. Go not up for the Lord is not among you that it shall not, so that you shall not be smitten before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you. And you shall fall by the sword because you are turned away from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord will not be with you. Was God with them at the White House? In the, in the Washington? No, he wasn't. God had already showed us he wasn't in the election. You and I are in the phase right now of the time of Jeremiah. Get ready for the siege. And I'm telling you, get ready for the siege, because it has only just begun. And I'm going to show you this. But they presumed to go up on the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. And the Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites, which dwelt in the land, and smote them, and discomfited them even into Hamora. Uh, so what I'm telling you, God showed us is time after time after time. And the people who are in Washington said, but no, we will go up. And God said, no, I'm not in this. But we will go up. And it discomforted them. And so what happened? Last week when I made the announcements right here in this pulpit, I said, they have no idea what they just did. They have just now unleashed the enemy where Satan wanted to be. Now, on Wednesday, if Trump takes the, 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 the podium and says, I'm back in, then you come to Tom and say, you're a false prophet. Right? So what do I do if there's a churches out there preaching otherwise? And I had one shot to do this, and I did it today. And I don't like doing this. I don't normally do it. But I had to do this today because of all the rumors that are out there to show where God does work, and he's working in you. He's not working out there with the rest of the world. So what else happens now? God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply his signs and wonders. So God hardened Pharaoh's heart time after time after time again, and now you're seeing it. They have now moved into the second phase of having Pharaoh come after them. That's what they did. They opened the door. Exodus 14 says, I harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them, and I will be honored among Pharaoh and upon his host and upon the, the Egyptians that they may know that I am the Lord, and he did so. Why do you think there's 25,000 troops in Washington, D.C.? It's to show Pharaoh is there. And he's going after the right. You realize what's going on here? This is spiritual. It's not physical. The modern day assault continues. Look at this. The, the, there has to be consequences. This is the left for Trump supporters. They have to be punished. You hear this? This is, this is real. This is not Germany. This is the United States right now. I'm going to be about late. I just looked at the clock. Bear with me in this one. I don't like to go past 60 minutes, but I'm not going to rush this. I'm getting close to the end. I am. But I do need a lot of good, at least 10 more minutes. There has to be consequences. The left call for Trump supporters to be punished. They need to be deprogrammed. Sound just like concentration camps in Germany. Washington Post columnist Eugene Robinson, New York Times Magazine, Nicole Hannah-Jones, who agreed that there is a need for millions of Americans, almost all white Israelite, almost all Republicans, to be deprogrammed and punished before the country can move on. You realize what that is? Pre-war normalization. Now, six months ago, you wouldn't think that it was possible. But now it's becoming normal. We need to go get them, guys. We need to deprogram them. What do we need to do? We need to put them in concentration camps. They need to go back to school. They need to be re-educated. The consequences for Trump supporters. How about this? German concentration camp. Hitler elected chancellor. 
June 30th, 1933. Look how fast things changed. By March 22nd, he opened up Dachau. That wasn't for the Jews. That was for the political dissenters. Those who were on the other side. That was for the, the people who did not agree with what was going on. That was Germany's first concentration camp for political dissenters. So now, here we have our timeline again. So now, let's put in the first piece of the puzzle. So I'm going to use the next week, the next, not next week, but next time I speak in two weeks, to begin building this puzzle. January 30th, 1933. That was the time that Hitler was appointed to office. President Paul von Hindenburg names Adolf Hitler leader or Führer to the National Socialist German Workers' Party or the Nazi Party as the Chancellor of Germany. The power that took place from around 25 to 29 was very slow. He was gaining power. By 1929, there was an event that happened because of America. It was called the Great Depression. Because our debt was out of control, the stock market crashed, and we couldn't deal with everything. Right now, you're seeing the stock market way up there. It has grown by 10,000 points in four years. You've watched the debt grow $10 trillion. Just this past week, Biden's new plan, let's give away another $1.9 trillion dollars on top of the 2.3 trillion we just approved and in two months we're going back to the kitty and we're going to do it again we don't have that money how are we going to do this we're building for the next stage when it collapses you will be at the state to where the people will blame somebody for this mess and who are they going to blame God says don't go against those people it's not going to come out well for you. But the people in Washington said, but we will go. We will take over the Capitol. We will sit in the White House. They're going after it. They gave them, the enemy, everything it needs now to launch an outright assault on the right. And they will. I'm going to show you that in just a, just a second. We are at that stage right here. Am I saying Joe Biden's Hitler? No. Remember, I'm talking about spiritual principle. The principle that drove this man is the same principle that's driving the left. It's an evil spirit. I'm not being judgmental. I'm being realistic and honest with you. God's spirit is not in any organization, any power, any political power that approves of the abortion and the gay rights, period. It's not there. If you believe he is, you're kidding yourself. By the way, in the right... They also approve of the gay movement. Why did God not put them back in the office? Because they didn't call out sin for what it was. Nor did Jonathan Kahn and his movement that was out there, when they had the opportunity, they went all around the holy days, they skirted the issue, and they brought in every now and then, they would talk about, well, you don't want to hurt the homosexual movement. God said, you had a chance. You didn't give me glory. And you didn't call out sin for what it was. It is over. I'm not backing this election. It's over. And the people said, but we will take it back. And as we see what happens from the Old Testament, God says, don't go. This is not going to end up well for you guys. And it did not end up well for us. We will see that in just four days. Going on. Get my clicker here. We're just about to wrap it up. Is history repeating itself? As Hitler was taking over power, an event took place that parallels what we have just witnessed at the Capitol building. You know what that was? Let me show you. This is out of Spiegel, a German newspaper and magazine in historical documentation. Once again, luck seemed to be on Hitler's side on February 27th, less than a week before the new elections of the Reichstag, Germany's parliament building was set ablaze. Wow. The blame was pinned on the Dutch bricklayer Marinus van der Lupe. Do you know there was a radical left person in the Capitol building whose goal was to rile everybody up to do this? 
to burn down the Capitol. I'm not making that up. That's for the FBI. They got him arrested. And there was others with bombs on the outside that they were getting to lay out. Now, most of the people there, 99% of them, probably peaceful people, just like any other place. But it doesn't matter now. It doesn't matter whatsoever. You are in the principle that even though it didn't get burnt down, the intent of what took place, that just happened. All right, let's go on. Hitler and Goring and Goebbels knew a propaganda. God said when they saw one, they said, man, this is just what we need. What do you think the left's thinking right now? Well, you think you say, oh, boy, we sure are lucky that didn't happen. Uh-uh. They are moving in the same spirit as this. They thought that was an answered prayer. And so does the left today. This is just what we needed, they're saying. If this fire is, I believe, is the work, this is by Hitler to his vice chancellor. If this fire, as I believe, is the work of the communists, then we need to crush this murderous plague with an iron fist. What are you hearing in the news? What are you hearing in politics, in the meeting? Impeach him. No, that's not enough. He needs to be removed and go to prison. Not just him. Did you work for him? Then you need to go to prison too. Did you vote for him? Then you need to be deprogrammed. If he work and you're a public and you voted for him, you voted against it, then you can't get a job in this country. Do you hear what's going on? Everything is against the Constitution that protects your rights. That's what's going on. It goes on and says, and crush they did. The day after the fire, the decree of the protection of the people and the state went out. It said, we need to protect the state. We need to protect the people. 25,000 troops across Washington, D.C. We need to protect the people. The representatives saying, we were losing our lives. We were that close to being killed. They're going to take us prisoner. That went into effect, allowing Hitler's Nazi to go after their political enemies with gusto. It was the wave of arrests set off by the Reichstag fire that ultimately made the rapid construction of the prisons Necessary. Many of those prisons would later become the concentration camp of the Jews. It was the beginning of dehumanization. Pre-war normalization. How do we go, as I began at the beginning, from a nation that loves and respects and lives under law to a nation that becomes like that we see of the example of Germany, where you reach the point where people say, it's good, they need to be going to prison. In fact, they need to be executed. In fact, what God says, they'll think when they kill you, they're doing God a service. How do we go there? We have just crossed that line right now. For that period of time that I showed you in that timeline, we will go from where we are today where the people in this country will hate you so much they think they're doing God a service. Next time, we'll talk about the modern-day Pharaoh. How he says, I will not let you go. We'll talk about the impeachment, the assault on free speech, the assault on the conservative press, the censoring of the right, and the assault on the conservative Christian. And I'll pick that up in part two on pre-war normalization of America in two weeks. <laughs>